we wake up on the northern peninsula to yet again another foggy morning. I open all of the doors to the truck to hopefully flush out all of the mosquitoes that got in there last night and then continue our morning routine. Get the dogs fed, let the wife have time to get ready, pack the trailer, and we get on the road. We typically don't let our gas tank get below a quarter of a tank, so it's time to stop in Cook's Harbor to fill up. In most of these small towns, the gas station is the hardware store, is the grocery, and the local meeting spot for all the old timers. Just a heads up, gas up here is around five bucks US a gallon. We're able to do this trip with amazing partners like X-Venture Trailers, Red Arc Electronics, and supported by Power Tube TV and Rugged Bound Supply Company. After an hour drive, our first stop is Lanso Meadows. At the eastern tip of Newfoundland's Great Northern Peninsula lies the first known evidence of European presence in the Americas. This is where Norse expeditions sailed from Greenland. In the visitor centers, there's awesome replicas of the boats they would have used. It'll always be on our mind. Is this fog what we're gonna be locked into for views for the rest of this trip? We head down the path to check out the actual meadows. First thing you come across is a statue called Meeting of Two Worlds. It's a bronze sculpture which symbolizes the meetings of Europeans with the first permanent residents in Lansos Meadows, the Aboriginal people. can clearly see where the original building stood. There's even a site where archaeological digs were happening along with surveying. They've built a true to the times town with timber and sod buildings that replicated what happened here a thousand years ago. also the first known site where metalwork was done in the New World. I imagine you had to get pretty cozy in these buildings. Being here, you can't help but imagine what it would be like back then. The walls are six foot thick, the fire pit in the middle, and all they had was family and each other. Miraculously enough, the fog finally cleared. We launched the drone from off-site to show what an amazing backdrop it would have been to live here. Icebergs in the bay, beautiful fields, and views for miles. Around the corner was a giant bronze statue of Leif Erikson. Before heading out of the area, we stopped at the Norseman for lunch. Didn't have a huge menu, but what we had was amazing. Just south of the meadows, there's a little Viking shop with carvings from whalebone, traditional hand-forged items, horn cups, so you know we had to pick a few things up. 
and out in the bay across the way, to our extreme delight, an iceberg close enough to get to. We're at the end of the iceberg season, so seeing these is a real treat. These are 10,000 year old glacial giants. Roughly 90% of the icebergs seen off Newfoundland and Labrador come from glaciers off western Greenland. Well, the rest come from glaciers in Canada's Arctic. The clear blue veins through these icebergs are from meltwater refreezing. A lot of people will actually go out and harvest this, and we'll tell you why a little bit down the road. The further we drive south, the more icebergs we get to see. We are told by a local that all of these originated from an iceberg the size of Lower Manhattan. That would have been something to see. Most travelers that we met told us they were going to go check out St. Anthony, so of course we added that to the list. St. Anthony serves as a main service center for Northern Newfoundland and Southern Labrador. We love seeing all the different styles of fishing boats coming in and out of the harbor. The area was pretty touristy and very packed, so we decided to move on pretty quickly. It's midday now, and we're heading to the last stop of the day, the town of Ingli. Just outside of town, wouldn't you know it, we finally see a moose. Even though it's just an adolescent, it's still pretty cool to see. Talk about a quintessential looking Newfoundland town. Half the town in the harbor, half on an island with an iceberg in the background. We found this camp spot on I Overlander, but when we got there, realized it's right next to the town cemetery. Not wanting to get any flack from the locals or be haunted, we headed up the mountain above the town to our secondary scouted camp spot. It's a great idea to always have two or three spots picked out on your maps before you go. You can also look at 3D maps on Gaia to know what kind of elevation change you're going to be getting. So we had pretty good warning that this is going to be a decent hill climb. Exploring areas that are not typically a tourist destination will get you to some of the most beautiful places. We almost skipped this area for a different one, and boy are we glad that we didn't. When I tell you that it pays to do research on your maps, this is a prime example. made it to the top of the mountain, to the town reservoir, a beautiful lake called Island Cove Pond, quite large for a pond, and set up camp for the afternoon. This is also the first opportunity we really have to dry things out and air out towels. 
There was no breeze. We put out the thermosail, and it worked perfectly. Time for dinner. Roll that beautiful bean footage. Just spending time next to water at a camp has never been so good. We have the Red Arc Rogue installed on our truck, along with a 1500 watt inverter, so it's time for keeping the wife happy pro tip number two. Bring in a few comforts of home will keep her happy. Being able to run an extension cord from the truck up to the trailer for a heating blanket will save your marriage. Old wife equals unhappy life. Close to bedtime, we only had one visitor, a local with his kids playing on a four-wheeler, and another batch of giant mosquitoes. The x Ventures lighting is also the perfect way to help pack up the trailer so in the morning you can just get up and go. It's also fair to mention that sunsets in Newfoundland just hit different. We have a pretty long day of driving today. We're heading out and off of the Northern Peninsula region. But first, we gotta get off this mountain. We put our brake controller on off-road mode and take it slow and steady down the mountain. As we're leaving this area, we spotted something special. A 1941 Bombardier. Created by Joseph Bombardier, these iconic Canadian snowmobiles have tracks on the back and skids on the front. Production stopped in 1951, but many of these vehicles are still being used today by commercial fishermen in Manitoba. It has a 12-person capacity, and I wish I could have taken a ride. We're hearing some unexpected squeaking coming from the Max Coupler on the trailer. So we checked our Gaia maps, found an auto parts store that I had marked, and had that sucker greased up. We're starting our day with a six and a half hour drive to get back down the peninsula. Just north of Gross Morn Park, we stop in Rocky Harbor for lunch, but the whole town is out of power. We hate to leave this picturesque town, but we head further south.
the terrain changes as we head out of central Newfoundland and into the northeastern region. It's much rockier and with a lot less trees. From all the stuff I researched, this is really what I thought it would look like for a lot more of the country. The roads in this area have also declined pretty quickly. This place is a drone cinematographer's heaven. Everywhere you point the camera, you get gold. Our next stop is a truly unique place. The small, mostly abandoned town of Round Harbor. Aside from the conversion of a handful of homes into summer cabins and a lone fisherman who refuses to leave, the community lies still. The government has paid most of the residents to move elsewhere. This is one of 600 abandoned towns across Newfoundland. It's one of those places that I would have loved to have seen in its heyday. Just hanging out here and taking it all in, we heard a familiar sound out on the bay that got us extremely excited. Seeing a humpback whale leisurely feed in the bay was truly a bucket list item. Hesitant to leave that special place, we headed up to our camp spot for the night. The cliffs above the town of La Cie. The name of the town originates from the French fishermen who called it La Cie, which in French means the Sol, because of the reference to the silhouettes of the hills around the town, which resemble the teeth of a saw blade. Another home run camp spot find. Time for another gourmet quick hot dog meal. 
While hanging out and enjoying dinner, we heard, again, another familiar sound. But this time, it was in a pair. I couldn't have wished for a more perfect afternoon with my small family on a cliff line in Newfoundland with some beverages listening to whales sing us to sleep. We didn't get up too early because Renee wasn't feeling the best. The next day we drove around the base of the mountain to the other side where we hiked to the overlook to check out where we camped all night before before heading in the town for some breakfast. There's only one spot for breakfast in this town, and that's the Outport Museum and Tea Room. It has a decent breakfast menu, amazing hosts, and a small museum to explore. We stayed for a while, got some town history talking to the owner, and after breakfast we got a tiny concert where the owners played what's called an ugly stick, a traditional Newfoundland instrument. While mapping, I usually put waypoints for showers for at least every two days. In doing that, we found Kona Beach Campground. It cost us six bucks total to have one of the best showers of the trip. It's also not a bad place after a long drive to sit and have a sandwich. When crossing onto Twillingate Island, the first thing you see is the Prime Birth Fishing Museum. Fully outfitted with a whale skeleton, we would have liked to explore this place, but it was closed. The town of Twillingate was also another place that we had to go see. This town on the bay was full of brightly colored buildings, fishing boats, and icebergs. First stop for me, lobster rolls. With Renee starting to feel even worse, I was going to be the only one having lobster rolls for this meal. Stopping at Staghead Brewing, I wanted to have a beer and pick up some beer for camp later. 
I also left a Country Boy beer that we brought with us from Kentucky for him. And of course, I had to try the sour that was on tap. With Renee's stomach declining quickly, we headed towards our camp spot for the night that I had scouted. We added a few more pinstripes to the truck and trailer getting back to this area, but when we got there we realized it was more of a dirt and gravel dump site than it would be a camp spot. So I popped the drone up to see if there's anything else in the area. And to my surprise, I saw a campground that I had missed while scouting. While driving around, these awesome people at this camp spot pointed out another one, and we went and quickly set up camp. Because we had four-wheel drive, we could make it up to this spot where other vans and campers couldn't. Renee was not doing well. She said it's a constant pain in her stomach and underneath her ribs, so she went straight to bed. The closest ER would be a helicopter ride across the country. Panic was starting to set in. A passing hiker, which turned out to be an ER doc from Chicago, lucky enough, stopped and took a look. He determined that it was most likely an inflamed gallbladder. He recommended some basic anti-inflammatories, fluids only, and to see if the inflammation would go away by morning on its own. I was grateful he was camping right below us. Sitting and watching the sunset, every scenario was running through my mind. I stayed up prepared to hook the trailer up to get out of there as fast as possible. Sitting there watching the fishing boats go out to sea, I couldn't help but let my mind go to the worst places. This would make for a very long night. <laughs> 